Welcome to the first episode of the Healthy Fats Podcast, where we uncover the remarkable stories of individuals who have harnessed the power of a primarily meat-based diet for root cause healing. I'm your host, Leon Grave Sandy, and today we have a truly inspiring journey to share with you. Our guest, Terry Haas, is a shining example of the transformative potential of a carnivore diet. Before embarking on our carnivore journey, Terry faced a series of health challenges that left her searching for answers. Frustrated by conventional treatments and determined to regain her health, Terry made the bold decision to explore a primarily meat-based diet. In today's episode, Terry will take us on a deeply personal exploration of her health struggles, the pivotal moment that led her to the carnivore diet and the incredible positive changes she experienced along the way. Her story is not only a testament to the healing power of meat, but also a source of inspiration for those who may be on their own health journeys. Join us as we dive into Terry Haas's remarkable story of healing with the carnivore diet and discover the lessons and insights she has to share with all of us. Terry, welcome to the show. Nice to meet you, and thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Oh, you're welcome. So please uh, tell the audience a little bit about yourself. I am a 57-year-old um, single woman <laughs> and looking, mm. um, and I have been in the, I guess, really the low-carb, high-fat community is where I started in 2015. Um, I, I had migraines for about 20-plus years. And mm -hmm. I found a migraine, well, actually, I found a migraines, a women's migraine support group on Facebook. And I joined that. And a woman in that group found a another migraine type of group that has a protocol that I started on and uh, found migraine relief. And that protocol was based on low carb, high fat. And um, so I, I, I got pretty immediate, actually, overnight relief from my migraines following that protocol. And within about six or eight months, um, the leader of that protocol first started to hear about keto and the ketogenic diet. And so she created a, ket a ketogenic group and I segued over from low carb high fat over to the ketogenic diet. And interestingly, this was before I'd ever heard of carnivore. Mm -hmm. um, but I essentially, when I moved over to keto, I didn't really, I guess I didn't really move to, to traditional carnivore, but I followed what I now call like a hyper carnivore diet, which means, I mean, if you really looked at my food eating over a year, you would say that I'm 100% carnivore. But if you looked at it on like on a daily basis type thing or a monthly basis, I do include some plant foods here and there. I definitely do use spices, but I do every once in a while have some onion or garlic or tomato or um something like that not not much more than that i've kind of dropped avocado um and so but literally the second that i heard that there was no need to ever eat plant foods again in my life i was just like i have found my way <laughs> because i was one that never liked vegetables i never really liked many fruits um i was also the girl that would be ordering a double bacon cheeseburger when my friends were getting you know chicken salads at lunch mm -hmm. um and so when i heard about carnivore i actually did jump head first in and just i mean i probably was a, a strict carnivore and my carnivore way of eating includes all meats seafood seaweed eggs mushrooms and dairy with the exception of lactose free dairy such as like yo yogurt quark and kefir mm -hmm. um, and i also don't include fermented dairy like yogurt in there as well um, so all of that so it's a it's a pretty broad um, carnivore um, diet that i eat and so i dove head first and dropped all the plants and um i was i was pretty strict for a couple of years and then all of a sudden one day i think i wanted you know a bite of avocado so i had a little bit of avocado and um i don't i don't eat them very much um mm -hmm. plant foods but occasionally occasionally they you know they want to be eaten or whatever i have a, a hankering for them so um so it's been i've been a carnivore I guess like a, a hard, hard earned carnivore since about 2016. 
different and unique, I think, in the way that I came about the carnivore space, mm -hmm. carnivores and um, so, uh, and it, it's a crazy space <laughs> over there. Um, I've been in somewhat of a bubble um, over uh, on Facebook. So that's where I found, I was in that, the, the migraine group and the lead brain brains, and we'll have those for life. And so um, since she's a PhD and she teaches doctors a lot of this stuff, it just kind of, I, I, I don't even really remember the evolution of how it came about because I did not know it. And like I said, did not know any of those big, you know, other doctors or social media influencers. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I honestly, I remember reading like, you know, the maybe some some books on like the ketogenic living and, and those types of things. And maybe that just kind of led me to an article. And then it, it I, I just kind of saw like, oh, there are other people that are actually not eating plant foods. Okay, so that's an actual thing. Yeah, but there was still, I think, something in me that just says, hey, you know, you can just eat animal, pro animal foods, animal products. Um, and so I just dove in head first. And um, at that time, I really didn't have any things that needed to be healed. Like I, like I joined the migraine group. And when I joined the migraine group, migraine group, I had gastritis and I had some anxiety and I had, um, I also had hypoglycemia, which I did not know. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't even have any feelings of it either. It wasn't until I kind of started uh, doing time restricted eating when I moved over to the ketogenic carnivore type of diet. And mm. I moved from like three meals a day to two meals a day, again, in earnest, and then kind of going just with my eating window. I mean, you always start to get a little woozy. I'm like, what is this? And so I already knew since I was already measuring my blood ketones and blood glucose that I was a little low in my blood sugars. And so I moved my meals up and, and all of that resolved. Um, fairly quickly with the exception of the gastritis and the gastritis continued actually up until just February of this year. So it continued despite me being on a carnivore diet. And it was very, not only perplexing, but maddening because I mean, I got, I got really super strict. I mean, for, for a couple of times I got really strict. I mean, I've never ever removed dairy or anything like that, but I have done trial runs where I thought, well, maybe it could be this, or maybe it could be pepper, or maybe it could be the, you know, garlic seasoning I'm using or something like that. And right. what it ended up being was the one and only medication that I was on and I had been on for over 25 years actually caused gastritis. So, um, I, so I'm thinking that I probably got off very easily and um, not as bad as I could have had I not been eating a carnivore diet, not having anything else to inflame or irritate my insides, you know? Mm. Um, so that was really the only things that I could think of that if you were to ask me what I was looking for to heal with a carnivore way of eating. And if you had asked me at that time, I'd have said, oh, I'm fine. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with me. You know, I'm going to be right. just fine because I did have lots of healing in my gastritis when I started it. So and it felt significantly better. But then mm -hmm. over time and things, stress, just whatever kind of um, irritates it, it would kind of act up. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like, I'm not eating any plants. Stop doing <laughs> that to me. <laughs> uh, and uh, let's see. So. How was like the transition to going to a low carb diet, like a carnivore diet? Did you kind of struggle with like keto flu or how was that for you? Uh, I did not struggle with any of that. So going back to like that, the migraine group and the keto, whatever, when, when she, when this woman's first started the keto group, her name is Dr. Angela Stanton and she is my life savior <laughs> among many others, thousands of others. Um, she, she she was just learning about the ketogenic diet and ketosis and all that kind of thing. And so when when she and another admin and I were in that group and we first started or whatever, we started measuring our blood sugar and blood ketones at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I say this, and I'm gonna say this very lightheartedly, and I don't wanna like get too deep into it because there's a lot involved in this, but I was in, I was in ketosis. Um, and she didn't know much about ketosis. And this was actually a really funny story because we were measuring and, and she and the other woman would be zero or 0.1 or 0.2. And I'm like 0.5 and 0.6, but my sugar was like in the mid seventies. At the time, we didn't really know that that was a, an insulin issue, but now I know that that can signal in, insulin issues. But they mm -hmm. kept, um, so then I would wake up or, or later on in the day, then my ketones would go to zero or 0.2. And so um, Angela was, 
freaking out. She's like, Terry, you've got to stay in or you've got to stay out. You've got to stay in. You can't go back and forth. And of course, I'm just going, I, I haven't done anything different. Like, I, I really haven't done anything different. I, I don't know what to do. What am I supposed to do? And she says, you've mm -hmm. got to choose in or out. And I'm like, okay, okay, I'm going to choose out, you know? Like, and so I'm like, I'm eating white bread and ice cream and potatoes and, and you know, all this stuff, right? And, mm -hmm. and so... For, for like three weeks, I was doing this, two or three weeks. I would eat that, and then the next morning I'd wake up, and I would still, I would be back to like 0. 0.5, 0. 0.6. She's like, oh, wow. you got to eat more. And I'm like, okay, I, I don't know what to do. And by three weeks eating that garbage, really after not really ever eating that much garbage of that in three weeks in my lifetime almost, I was starting to feel pretty icky. <laughs> you know, I was starting yeah. to feel foggy and just less than. So I finally just said to her, I said, Angela, I said, I don't know what's going on, but I haven't really done anything different than what I was doing before. So I'm just going to take my chances and go back to eating the things that I really liked to eat and that made me feel good and then a few months later then she learned all about it she's like oh okay this is how it works you make ketones and you're using them and they reduce or they're using that you're using them and they you know they're at this level of ketosis or you're at this level of you know pre-ketosis or you're not using them they're backing up and they're you know increasing so um and that's why i say i was I don't know if I was actually in a safe or, or healthy mode of ketosis with the higher insulin and the lower blood sugar, but I was making ketones <laughs> higher than they were at the time. So long story short, I had zero transition whatsoever. Um, the thing that was missing for me and to begin with was actually drinking the right amount of water and then mm -hmm. adding salt to my diet. So I was completely salt free with the exception of putting it on my french fries and I was over hydrating by 20 Twice as much water as I need for my my body weight so I halved my water and I started adding salt and I've never had a migraine since and I've never gone through any keto flu or any transition period or anything like that That's good. <laughs> and are you following like a kind of like time restricted uh, time restricted feeding or intermittent fasting schedule now are you continuing that I do, yes. I, I, for, for, I remember even in high school, but I know I didn't eat, didn't eat breakfast every morning in high school. You try mm -hmm. to eat breakfast because that's what you're supposed to do. And then you get to college and you hear more and more, well, back in the 80s anyway, you went to college and, um, you know, you've got to fuel your fire, fill, fill that fire, feed that fire. It's going to burn out. And so you have to mm -hmm. eat your breakfast and eat your snack and eat your lunch. And I just remember like, dreading that because I'm like, I just don't want to eat, you know, and forcing something down and then not being able to eat for hours later. Um, and so um, I was actually already naturally TRE, time restricted eating. Um, mm -hmm. When I joined that migraine group, it had been for years just because like I said, I wasn't hungry. Um, and I was going and working out fasted already too, because again, I wasn't hungry. Um, right. So I, I have done some fasting. I think the longest I fasted is three days. And that was really just to kind of see if I could reset, you know, like my immune system or my stomach, you know, the stomach lining replaces itself after two days or something like that. So in trying to heal the gastritis, I was doing some fast and 48 hour fast in there and I would get some relief. But um, now I'm I don't, I want to say I'm low in weight, but I'm pretty much at my ideal body weight. And I kind of, you know, kind of play with losing a few pounds and gaining a few pounds. And so that's my, uh, ticket to say, you don't really need to fast. Now, sometimes occasionally I will, my body just says to fast. It's be like, okay, it's, I'm not hungry at all. What's going on here? Let me I kind of take stock. And so I'll just say, I feel good, but I'm just not hungry. So I just won't eat because if I'm not hungry, there's no reason to eat. And some sometimes I'll notice maybe the next day I feel a little lethargic or a little tired and maybe mm -hmm. that my body was fighting a bug and that's why it didn't eat and then I'll be over it or something, you know? So, but purposely fasting, I, I don't do that on purpose, no. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people, you know, they don't realize that when you fast, you're actually doing some healing with your gut, you know? So. Yeah. This is true. Of... And yeah, that in that catabolic state, there's lots of lots of healing going on. That's exactly why I won't why um, the fasting works. Mm -hmm. And how long have you been? Uh, so you're a metabolic health coach, like for someone who may not know what a metabolic health coach is. Can you describe that for us? A metabolic health coach is somebody that helps 
someone heal from their metabolic health issues. And I know that's a very loaded word and a very big sounding word, but in, instead of saying the whole panacea of like, I help somebody with PCOS and insulin resistance and diabetes and autoimmune conditions and that or whatnot, it's just a catch all um, word that all of those conditions fall under. So mm -hmm. um, if you know you have a metabolic health condition, then that would be, uh, I would be someone that you would seek. So, and I've been doing this since about 2018, I think. Mm, okay. And uh, I saw you're part of uh, Nutrition Hackers. I that... am, yes. I'm also okay. um, recently, that was something that just uh, recently um, was created, and I'm also a coach through them as well. Okay. And let's see here. Okay. So what do you, uh, what would you say are like the biggest benefits of maybe doing a carnivore diet over, uh, you know, maybe something else like what, uh, what are the, the biggest positive changes for that? Um, well, I'm going to be extremely biased because you're talking to someone, you know, that didn't really like fruits and vegetables. Okay. Um, so for me, I mean, it like, I would just go, well, gosh, you know, I just didn't want to eat plants. So why? <laughs> Why do you? Um, yeah. But I guess just I know I know that clients and members of the migraine group that come in and and just even anyone on social media and those types of questions like why why all meat and and w what is the purpose of that and aren't you afraid of that and what is it like you said what does it heal um, and just outside of my own self now I have this broad. Um, group of almost 16,000 members in that migraine group now that I have seen um, heal from remarkable illnesses, from chronic illnesses, and in in relatively short time. And and it's something that you can't deny. And it's not anything I'm making up. It's not anything I'm reading into. These people are there of their own free will, of their own free choice. They do not have to follow anything that is written in that protocol. Um, and a lot of them go not uncommonly kicking and screaming towards it um it is not required to be a uh, carnivore to follow that protocol or anything but you do heal quicker from migraines mm -hmm. and migraines um migraineurs are glucose intolerant by due to our genetics that's just part of having a migraine brain and so when when um when members realize, and when when I can get other people, because it's it's not just migraineurs that are sensitive to glucose at, at this stage of the game. We all are. We all are running around with some level of um, insulin, some degree of insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. And so when you can explain the role of plant foods and exogenous glucose um, in the way that the body works, and in the way that insulin works, and in the way the body responds to that. Um, and they can see and feel that real time, like in a hypoglycemic event or measuring their blood sugar and their blood ketones, then it's very easy to convince them. I don't even have to convince them. Then they can see it for themselves. It's a learning opportunity for themselves. So, and I will also say that if you're coming to me or if you're in the migraine group of which I'm an admin, um, I feel like you've probably already done a lot of research. You've already tried other things because carnivore still at the stage of the game seems to be very extreme and something that not a lot of people know of or are aware of yet. And so my thoughts are that you've already been experiencing a lot of pain. You've already tried a lot of modalities. And so now it's, it, you're like, you know, I guess I'm going to try this really extreme diet of meat only. And I mean, that. When you say it like that, even myself who loves meat, <laughs> me that sound it, and it 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 makes my mouth go, Bleh, you know, and I don't know why that is, um, and and that's my own work that I have to do, but I can understand others feeling that same way, especially when you come from this colorful array of of your plate and your menu and that sort of thing to a very eating carnivore is extremely bland. I mean, you get pink, brown, mm -hmm. and white, right? And so basically, is what you got in there. Um, a little bit yellow, I guess, too, with butter, right? So, um, and so, yeah, and then, then people say they like their fruits and they like their vegetables and, and then it's, it can be a journey for some people. And, and, and I think that the journey just includes them feeling better 
and feeling better. And that just inclines them and motivates them to, to change further. And I really think that it is something that once one starts, you will feel some type of benefit in a short amount of time that you will then be amazed and surprised and maybe curious to continue to see what else it can do for you. How long did you kind of um, have the migraines? Like, how long, when did that start? And um, I started with my first migraine after the birth of my third child at 28. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know that there's people start when they're younger, people start when they're, when they're older. Um, I know that when I would drink, um, and it didn't have to be, it could be like one drink or it could be five drinks, it didn't really matter. I would get pretty hellacious hangovers and typically vomit. <laughs> And I know, yeah, and I know now after having migraine that those those hangovers were probably more migraine related than than not migraine related because they were pretty awful and they're pretty comparable to a migraine. But a migraine is worse. Let me just put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, it lasts longer. You can a hangover can last a day, but migraines can last four days, week. You know, chronic for four months. <laughs> That's something I never really had any issues with was migraines, even when I was eating the standard American diet or very high, high carb. But my wife actually complains sometimes about migraines. So maybe it's something I should <laughs> try to see. Yeah, join the group and we can help her out. And I mean, it's for a lot of people, um, it's something that they find really quick relief from. And then you have some that it just depends on your history and your willingness to, you know, jump in and make changes really too. Yeah. And how did, um, like your family and friends, when did you ever kind of let them know that you're doing this carnivore diet and how did they think about that? Or did, um, is anyone, have you influenced anyone to give it a try to, for healing? Well, so when I first started the low carb, high fat protocol and then moved to keto, um, my parents were doing it. Um, and my parents, um, they had a good time and they, and I was even a couple of times whenever I visit them, whatever, when they were out of the state, <laughs> I would bring my blood sugar and ketone monitor and I would measure them and they were in ketosis as well. And then I think without having any direction or, um, and in all honesty, I think what happened, and this can happen to a lot of people as well, when they start a ketogenic diet, and now knowing what I know, learn, learning uh, along the way about a ketogenic diet, that a ketogenic diet really is not a sustainable diet, and really isn't a type of way of eating for the majority of people. It's really geared towards those that have epilepsy, brain injuries, cancer and stuff, and really for people that should not have any glucose, exogenous glucose at all, or minimal amounts that their body makes just from the foods that they eat in their brains because they really need to have all the ketones. So mm -hmm. it's a it's a um, it's kind of almost a travesty to have this ketogenic diet. And I'm talking the true one, not the fad, which I actually call modified standard American diet, because all you've done is switch from real sugar to, you know, sugar alcohols and you switch from flour to coconut and almond flours. And that is not a ketogenic diet. Okay. Um, that is a fad ketogenic diet, um, but a true ketogenic one, which is one that I was trying to follow when I first started. And so when I got my parents to follow to it, and I think like many people, it, you feel great. It's euphoric. You're running on ketones. You have all this energy. And then you get to a point where something doesn't seem to work anymore. And that's what happened with my parents. And so they didn't like it and they were, they were losing energy and they were, they didn't feel good anymore. So they have since transition transitioned back to standard American diet. Mm -hmm. I have one, my, uh, I have three children and my youngest daughter she did the keto diet for a bit and she time restrict uh, she tres herself um and my second child he's a boy a uh, man i should say um he also does the ketogenic diet and also cycles through carnivore too and he does fasting and time restricted eating um and hmm i don't think i've gotten any friends to segue over um that's, I don't think so. I do have a granddaughter and when she's over here, um, I feed her as carnivore as I can. She's a little bit more hyper carnivore and now she's almost three. So she's been introduced to a lot more standard American diet foods. And um, so I keep some foods here that I don't eat for her and I will get some other plant foods for her um, 
fresh fruits and stuff like that for her to eat. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, so far I haven't converted, not to the best of my knowledge, I haven't converted anyone yet. <laughs> so what is hyper carnivore? Um, hyper carnivore, so I, I, I believe, I don't know if Angela, the, the migraine creator, coined the term or not, but um, so I know that there's like all sorts of terms. There's like keto, keto carnivore, keto this, that, the other. So hyper carnivore is kind of what I was describing earlier where you would maybe have a couple of grams of plant foods mm -hmm. in your, in a meal and not every day and not every meal. So like half an avocado with this meal or, you know, some onion with this burger, that type of thing. So just a nominal amount of plant foods here and there. There's a, it's, it can be difficult though, again, navigating the carnivore space because unless you've got like stable insulin and you have some metabolic flexibility to be able to segue or go in between ways of eating. And, and when I, when I say that, what I mean by that is one of is, one of them is going to be, um, you eating plant foods and one of them is going to be not eating plant foods. And there's two mm -hmm. different types of, um, gut flora and all sorts of things that kind of go in mixing those two. And if you don't have this metabolic flexibility or stable insulin, if you're not eating enough carbohydrates, plant foods, to support your fuel needs, since you might still be a glucose burner, you're going to have this keto flu or this type of carnivore flu or feel less than, not have the energy that you need. So you can kind of be in this in between. Um, yeah when you add just a small amount of plant foods in. So you're at this keto level territory of carbohydrates, but you're not yet ready for keto level, um, um, I should say keto level ketones is what I should say, since you're still mainly a glucose burner. Um, mm -hmm. So people can get into trouble there. So um, hyper carnivore would be something that I would recommend after you've gone through carnivore and had some healing of your insulin rather than going from a low carb, high fat or standard American diet to a hyper carnivore diet. There could be some insulin and energy trouble uh, for yourself if you're kind of in between there before you've had some healing. Hmm. It's, I think uh, Dr. Barry kind of calls it ketovore. Ah, yeah, that's another term. I, yeah, so being in this bubble, I'm just not familiar with, with those all those terms. And so I, I'm like trying to Google it. It's not very <laughs> easy to Google those terms either, so. <laughs> yeah, no, it's okay. Yeah, that's basically call that I usually sometimes get into um I mean I've been in nutritional ketosis mm -hmm. but uh not it's not something I stay in for very long um just depends how long I fast for so mm -hmm. I've done uh, I've done at least 62 hours this year so oh, wow. I mean then then I was in nutritional ketosis but you know and then I'll usually break the fast with um uh, you know some bone broth and mm -hmm. kind of start off something light and and stuff so I know my very first 72 hour fast I love duck and um, so I actually made a duck and and some duck uh, bone broth to break my first three-day fast I had a couple of other girlfriends we were gonna we were doing it together and you know it's it's very easy to TRE you know if you don't eat 18 hours 24 hours it's very easy but when you plan a fast the, the handful that I've I've planned a fast maybe three times, and this was my first planned fast. That first day, 18 hours in, I was dying. I was like, I am so hungry. This is ridiculous, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, anyway, the three days, this the three days was up, and I go and I and I'm so excited to drink this duck bone broth. I'd never had duck bone broth in in my life, also. So I have my duck bone broth because you know you have to refeed slowly, right? Right. Oh, uh, let me just say, please, people, do not ever <laughs> refeed with duck bone broth. It is extremely high in fat. <laughs> that's, that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> so I was, um, the bathroom and I were friends for quite a while that <laughs> evening after I broke my fast. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Some of those trials and tribulations of the carnivore diet when you eat too high fat when your body's not quite ready for it. <laughs> I guess I'm, I would say I'm, what is it, metabolically flexible because... Yeah. What about you? Like, uh, would you uh, kind of call yourself that? Do you think you're at that point? Yeah. Yes. I, I believe I am. Yes. I can, uh, since I can eat those small amount of plant foods and feel fine after that. Um, and 
Um, admittedly, if there were you were to find me some days in the summer, you might find some cherries and watermelon in my refrigerator. Um, I don't eat I don't eat a lot of them, but every once in a while I'll crave it, and so I eat them and um, you know figure, okay, I'm just gonna rank up my insulin here <laughs> and see if I've still got it, <laughs> test it out. <laughs> And then, um, but I, I, I seem to be quite fine. I mean, even eating those cherries and the watermelon and stuff, like I'll eat nine cherries and, and I don't count them out. That's just by nine, I'm full, I've had enough and I'm, and I'm sweet enough, you know, after that. Yeah. And so I'm still in, I mean, I, I, you know, you segue in and out of ketosis. You can't always be in ketosis because we have to be anabolic, um, certainly so. But yes, yeah. I, I find that I am metabolically stable at this point. And if I have too much protein, that usually will kick me out. I mean, I'm I'm pretty much two meals a day, um, mm -hmm. but it's very hard for me to to even eat two meals and be almost zero carb. It's very hard for me to even stay in like a low ketosis. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, maybe if I do like eighteen and twenty hours every day, I could probably do that. Mm -hmm. but yeah. Well, when you eat protein, though, so w when you when you eat protein. Mm -hmm. It does, if you've eaten enough protein to reach what is, you know, the leucine threshold, and the leucine mm -hmm. threshold is a personal um, number for each individual, um, mm -hmm. that's what allows for protein synthesis when you reach your leucine threshold. Mm -hmm. And when you reach protein synthesis, you are actually taken out of ketosis because it's that action, that anabolic action that, re that takes you out of ketosis. So mm -hmm. you are building up then, you're repairing. And so during those hours or um, however long you're personally in ketosis, and that is also a very personal individual thing based on your um, insulin health. Um, so you want to be taken out of ketosis because you want to reach your loose, you want to be in protein synthesis because that's where the mm -hmm. healing of the mitochondria and the cells all takes place. That's where the repair and the building. Um, protein synthesis is not just about building muscle. It's actually the entire scaffolding of our bodies. So um, that's, I mean, it could take someone time to even build muscle um, mm -hmm if they're not metabolically healthy and have had, you know, that type of um, issues in the past, whatever, but it can take some, someone time to even get to the point to build muscle um, after, you know, eating um, enough protein. So it's not like you eat protein, I mean, you eat protein just to build muscle. It does, it's, it li literally builds and repairs the entire body. Body, okay. And uh, what are you eating? Like, can you just kind of describe what you're eating daily? Does it kind of change or pretty much the same? It does. Um, when I first started, um, I remember um, I've, I never have really liked other types of meat already. I mean, I've always been a beef lover my entire life. Um, mm. I'm not much of a chicken lover. Um, pork was just bacon, maybe a pork tenderloin. Um, and then when I started carnivore, it was just ribeye, ribeye, ribeye. And that lasted for about a day, uh, a, day a year. Um, I think I was eating two and three ribeyes a day. It was just like, whatever I want to eat, I'm going to eat. And then milk, and ribeyes and milk and butter. And then um, about a year in, I don't know what happened, but ribeyes just made me sick. And so mm. I started eating, um, and, and I actually ate this meal almost every day for four years. <laughs> and I've just started branching out like the last two years. Um, and I named him. <laughs> because I am single and I figured might as well look at, make it look like, you know, I'm having a lot of fun with Pierre <laughs> and Pierre, my Pierre meal is a, uh, a beef tenderloin, a little filet tenderloin, not so little. It's about a half a pound. And, um, I serve it with a side of sauteed, uh, in ghee mushrooms. And I top that with a little bit of Gruyere cheese. And then, um, I drink half and half. So I no longer drink milk. I have graduated to half and half because <laughs> fat. And then for my second meal, it just depends because sometimes my first meal, depending on how big, how big the, um, the steak is, because it can range anywhere from 200 to 300 grams. Um, and that is anywhere from like 
12 to 1600 calories kind of depending and I usually eat around 2000 2100 calories a day so I, my first meal I just eat until I'm full until I can't take another bite and then if like in a couple of hours I'm not hungry again what I'll go do then is going to go track and look at my chronometer to see like how many calories was that because I should be getting hungry now and I'm like okay well that was 1600 calories okay that makes sense so then I'll kind of look at the time and it's like okay it's 7 30 you need to eat a few more calories you know to get in before you get to bed because I'm trying to maintain my weight hmm. the snack will just kind of bump up the protein synthesis as it would or kind of bump up um, and that's going to be like I uh, one of my recipes that I've created um, is called carnivore crumbles and so I'll have that either plain with some heavy whipping cream like a bowl of cereal or maybe I'll add some fruit to it or maybe I'll just make a charcuterie plate or if it's been just like a, a thousand calorie meal then I'll have like a bacon, you know, two bacon wrapped hot dogs fried in tallow or, um, or I will decide that it's time to share another recipe. <laughs> so I'll think of a meal and, um, video that and just do something that I don't normally eat. But if it was just me and I was not creating recipes and, and wanting to share some fun, creative things to eat besides just meat, my meals are pretty, pretty boring and easy. It's just, is it's just, it's just too easy to cook this way. And I cube up, egg, toss it in the my deep fryer, and 90 seconds later I'm eating. Or I stick something in my um, Dutch Dutch oven or in the oven, and you know, four minutes later I'm eating, and it's it's beef 99% of the time. <laughs> Boring mm -hmm. but tasty. <laughs> and you do you post your recipes on YouTube? What's the? Uh... I do my YouTube channel. It it it's dedicated more or less to my carnivore recipes, carnivore treats. Um, although I did, I have pushed the envelope on two of the recipes. One of them is a lemon poppy seed bread. Um, and I, I have a lemon there. And so I still call it carnivore. And then the other one really isn't carnivore because there's a pumpkin in it, but I went ahead and put it anyway, just telling people with the caveat that, you know what, here's something to choose that will keep you as close to carnivore as, as you can be, and also enjoy a treat if you'd like and not feel so alone or outside if you're at a party or holiday gathering or something like that. So, and that's my, um, it, and, and on my Facebook and TikTok and Instagram are just anything, any, any and all of my recipes, but they are all low carb, high fat, mm -hmm. and they are all um, added sweetener, grain, nut, starch, and seed oil free recipes. Okay. What do you think about this uh, recent craze <laughs> with uh, people eating sticks of butter? You know, it's funny. It's funny because first of all, I'm not. I'm. Um, I know snacking. Going back to what we were saying earlier about snacking. So if you're snacking, then that is going to, that food that you're snacking on outside of a meal is going to be used as glucose since you're not eating protein and you're not eating enough leucine to meet your protein, you know, meet your leucine needs to reach protein synthesis. Mm -hmm. So that will turn to glucose. But that being said, when I first started, and I didn't know any of that information, but I also knew I wanted to stay on track. What I did was I actually took heavy whipping cream shots. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. I mean, I have the little, the little thing and you put the, the, the air in it or whatever. And you, oh, I would just, I'd be like, I'm hungry and I want a piece of cake. What should I do? And so I would just, you know, fill my mouth with heavy whipping cream that I whipped with no sugar, just plain. Right. And then, you know, after time that just literally went by the wayside. As a matter of fact, that memory just came up on my Facebook feed the other day from 2018. And it was like, if you're not taking heavy whipping shots, are you even carnivore? I think I wrote <laughs> something like that. And I had a lot of kind of feedback. They're like, do you still do that? I'm like, well, no, because I know better now. But, but, but I also said to this person that, re that commented, I said, I said, no, this, this would not be something that I do now, but it would still be something that I would recommend somebody to do if you feel like you're going to eat off plan. Because if you're going to be eating sugar, if it's sugar or a heavy whipping cream shot, I'm going to tell you to have the heavy whipping cream shot because that's going to keep you on plan and make you feel better. Um, but, but my real true advice to you would be like, really honestly, if you're hungry, that means you need to eat a meal and that would be eating a meal that meets, you know, all your carnivore needs and enough protein. But I mean, so, um, so essentially I was eating butter. It just was pre butter, right? Yeah. <laughs> so when I see these people eating butter, 
it gags me because I was never one to eat butter. I, I actually literally sit there and go, wouldn't you rather just guzzle down some heavy whipping cream? Because that's so much tastier and goes down so much easier. But, um, you know, teach their own. <laughs> and uh, can you kind of, you know, I saw that reel that you did about lettuce. Oh, oh no, not <laughs> the, the one with the t-shirt? Yeah, the one with the t-shirt. So oh, okay. how, how, how did you decide to kind of come up with that or... Oh my uh, gosh, you got me blushing. Okay, so yeah. um, I'm going to go, go ahead and be 100% honest here. I got that t-shirt specifically to do that reel. And <laughs> I got that t-shirt six weeks before I got up the guts to do that reel. <laughs> um, and my reasons for doing that were, were a couple fold. And I am 57 years old. And I look pretty good for 57 and I wanted to kind of advertise how I look. I don't mm -hmm. really go to the gym. Um, actually, I don't go to the gym. So let me just go ahead and do that. I, I do walk um, a couple miles each day. I live in Houston, it's flat, so there's no hills. But I just kind of wanted to showcase that this is how I look at 57 eating a carnivore diet. Um, and so a little bit of, you know, uh, blah, blah, what's the word? Provocative, I guess. Mm -hmm. I don't I think that's the second time I've used sex in anything that I have um, put on fa uh, in any of my social media stuff. So I was a little hesitant with that regard um, because that's not the way that I want to present my page. But I thought, eh, you know, go ahead and get a little kicks or whatever. And maybe also to um, timeline what I looked at like at 57. Um, and then also to kind of just be again a little provocative with the t-shirt <laughs> right. um and just kind of just my way of saying to plant food it's not, you, uh... you can keep it i appreciate it, but i mean I, I you know just um because my parents aren't <laughs> too happy with it and i'm like i'm 57 and single <laughs> like and it's a bathing suit bottom i didn't show anything that you know like it, it was a very conservative bathing suit bottom too <laughs> yeah it's like, if i tried that i don't know I don't know if I would, I would get followers or lose followers. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I mean, do you find, are there any negatives uh, you think to doing carnivore diet all primarily? You know, um, there are some negatives. And I think the big, the biggest negative, which really does impact me, even though it shouldn't, but it does. Um, and is that it's just, possibly the worry and the concern and the downright incredulity of people of what I eat. Um, and then not having any of that when I was, you know, having migraine chronic for four months. Um, I lost, I, I was actually six, 60 pounds overweight, but this was way back when, over 30 years ago, and I lost that weight way back then. Um, so I can't use that as a term for right now, but, um, and nobody knew that I ha had hypoglycemia or any of those gastritis problems. I mean, I had my gallbladder out, but, and we know now mm -hmm. that as a byproduct of in the standard American diet. Um, so that, that, that it would be the next, people's attitudes towards my eating would be a negative. And most of the time it doesn't bother me. Um, but I have family members that, that voice valid to them concern over this. And that that's difficult to navigate um, because I don't talk to them about what they eat. And so I just say to them, you know, let's just leave this off the table. I appreciate your concern. I have the same concerns for you. And I understand that you're not gonna change me and I'm not gonna change you. So let's just enjoy our meal and love each other. And that's just what I do. Um, and then the second, the second thing that I can think of that's negative, and again, I'm just gonna be completely honest, even after being eating this way for almost eight years now, I do get bored occasionally. Um, sometimes I just wish that I could open a bag of chips or have a, 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 um, a bowl of cereal um, because I either don't want to cook anything or I don't have any, I mean, there's not really any excuses because with an air fryer, you can have a steak ready in 10 minutes. So there's really no excuses other than the fact that I just want to grab a bowl of cereal and sit on the couch and watch TV like the old days, you know? Not my carnivore crumbles either, just cereal, you know? And I mean, you know, there's 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 been some whiny times where you're like, God dang it, I just want a bowl of cereal. I want a bowl of popcorn, you know? Um, and then you just get over it because it's like, that's not the way I eat. I don't have those things here to support that anyway. And if I did, I probably wouldn't eat it anyway, you know? Yeah. Um, so those would probably be the two negative things. And then 
along with the first one, sometimes it can be difficult to eat out. But since since COVID and kind of the world has changed since then, and then also that gave myself a deeper dive into eating carnivore, which eliminated anything, you know, um, that wasn't carnivore by eating out. Because you can inadvertently get seed oils and all those things, right? So now I'm, I hate to say extremely sensitive, but I'm, those things taste terrible. When you go to eat them now, if I go out to eat, the food tastes terrible because it's not cooked in butter and it's not cooked in this and it's not cooked in that. So while I can say, you know, going out to eat might be a negative, I don't think really in the grand scheme of things, it's all that negative because I can pick where I want to go. Um, I, I don't have to go and, um, Eating out is expensive nowadays anyway, <laughs> so yeah. save me some pennies. <laughs> and what is your favorite like cooking fat? Is it butter or something else? Um, you know what? My, my favorite cooking fat, that's a tough one. Like I use t beef tallow the most because mm. that's what I've got in my deep fryer. And I probably use my deep fryer probably five times a week. There was a time I was deep fat frying every meal for about two months. When I first started deep fat frying, everything went in the deep fat fryer. Mm. And I will say, just so y'all know, do not put a filet tenderloin in, in the deep fat fryer. I have taken one for the team. It was terrible. I cried because I ruined a filet and they're expensive. So don't do that. But I mean, I put bacon wrapped hot dogs and I put lamb cubes and I put, um, I mean, bacon ribeye cubes um today for the first time ever i tried out and i'll have a reel on it later is a, a top sirloin i'm like i wonder if top sirloin would be good in there fabulous mm. <laughs> so. that's great yeah. um and are there any additional like health goals the you know just kind of with the carnivore diet anything else you're kind of trying to do or achieve um you know, not anything that I'm trying to I'm trying to do or achieve. No, but I after eight years of, of doing this, um, what I am noticing, and this I see this very commonly with other people too, um, that um, I'm having like I've had a few little tiny skin tags, and those of all those fell off a couple of years ago. But I've gotten just some skin. I don't even know what they are, but growths, I suppose, like just like raised something that those are all fading away. Um, even some moles or have fallen off. I even took a couple, there was something on my back that was itching one day and I thought, this is crazy. And so I was, as I was itching it, it just felt weird. My, a whole mole came off of my finger and I'm like this, and I took pictures and I was going to post it. This was early on when I first started on Instagram and I thought, you're not going to get one single follower if you post that nasty thing. So maybe in a year I'll fall, you know, when I get more followers and it's more apropos, but, um, I've seen a, a bunch of people like, you know, um, one guy show how he had a, a freckle on the top of his head and, and he keeps his head shaved and wow. like, you know, a couple of years later it's gone. And I'm, I'm noticing the exact same thing. Um, just my skin is more glowing and, um, so I'll take all of these. It feels like eating carnivore is the fountain of youth. Just like I'm age reversing and I just have more energy and um, just feel youthful. I feel better than I did when I first started. That's for sure. <laughs> right. So, you know, using the carnivore diet, you know, you basically kind of gotten rid of your migraines, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you have more energy and feeling a lot better. Yes. Great. And um, is there any advice you have for the viewers? Like um, any final words you'd like to, to share with them? Um, if you are interested in starting a carnivore diet, my I had three tips and I always forget the third one. <laughs> but the first one is <laughs> um, enjoy all of the meats. Because like I said earlier, when, um, like I mean, I pigged out on bacon um, initially at first. Um, and because what will happen, and I see this across the board in the carnivore community, um, your your desire and like for all meats will lessen and shrink over time um, the longer that you are eating carnivore. Um, let's see, I, I don't think I can remember two or three right now either. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and, and and that, that I'll go ahead and, and um, segue over to that just for a moment too, just to say that the reason I started the carnivore, I'm sorry, my YouTube channel over there with the carnivore treats was to kind of deal with the second negative aspect of eating carnivore is that, and that's when you get bored or you have meat aversion um, where you just are like, I just do not want to eat meat. What can I do? And so all of my recipes would be something that you could um, 
eat instead of, or like maybe have a smaller portion of meat. Um, I know with my clients I work with that, that come from a plant-based way of eating or don't eat a large portion of meat in their meals. Um, I say, well, what, how does a cheeseburger and vanilla milkshake sound? And they say, well, that sounds kind of good. And so I just, I have a carnivore milkshake recipe that I've created and that's got whey protein powder in there. So right already you've got a great amount of leucine in just that mm -hmm. nice fat, juicy, cheeseburger and you that'll go down in a few bites and you drink your vanilla milkshake and there's a meal that doesn't really feel like it was really meat you know so right. that my reason and my mission to create my youtube channel and the recipes was to bring approachability sustainability fun and adventure to um a carnivore way of eating so it, to just to show to people that it, it isn't always about meat and that you can have fun eating this way and we don't miss out on anything i've got ice cream cakes and bacon ice cream sandwiches and um, bread, pizza crusts, pie crusts that are all carnivore. So, um, yeah, I mean, really good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if I like to cook, I would probably do a lot of that. Well, and I'll, I will just say that they're also or very bread. easy because they're along the lines of carnivore because, again, it's, it's a lazy way of eating for the most part. But yes, there are more steps involved with making my treats than just a regular carnivore meal. <laughs> yeah, that's great. No, it's good that you have variety because sometimes, you know, you do need that, right? Just to yes. kind of mix it up. Um, and, some, and so coming from, you know, I know that a lot of people think that eating carnivore is a weight loss way of eating. And carnivore is not a weight loss way of eating carnivore is an evolutionary elimination healing way of eating so it is to heal the damage from eating plant foods and standard american diet and processed foods and that sort of thing along the way people can lose weight and people can gain weight it really depends on what your body decides to heal at what part of the stage that you're in so there's a larger um community in the carnivore community that does use it to lose weight and mm -hmm. for those people it wouldn't be such a big deal if you were to skip a meal or eat less than you need at a meal but for coming from from my point of view and my perspective as somebody that can't really afford to lose any weight to mm -hmm. just tell us to skip a meal or fast is not very good advice um, so uh, that's where I came in with my treats. It's like, well, if I, you know, if I have to eat something or I, you know, I can't eat something, but I need to eat something, um, then this will be better than nothing because mm. not, not eating when you need to eat or whatever is, and you're smaller, it doesn't feel so great <laughs> until you're that's, insulin stable. <laughs> all right. It's, uh, like with me, I think, um, like I have my body set weight cause it really doesn't fluctuate much. Yep. Um, so it's always kind of around a, a certain uh, average. So, and yeah. I'm the same weight as I was in high school, like give or take two mm -hmm. pounds. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah, that's, that's me too. Once I got <laughs> healthy, I was pretty much around that, around that weight. Crazy. Well, thank you for coming on and uh, sharing your story with us and the insights. Thank you, Leon. Yeah. I appreciate, I appreciate you having it. me. You're welcome. And uh, if you enjoyed this, watching this episode, you know, please go ahead and give us a review. And uh, it's going to be posted on YouTube and Apple Podcasts. And uh, I have to see where else I'm going to put it. But, okay. You know, if you enjoyed watching this video, please go ahead and give us a like and uh, a review or any feedback. And uh, thanks for tuning in. And uh, that's it. Have a great day.